cogent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I am Jamie Masters. And today on the show, we have Ken Rusk. You can find him at KenRusk.com. He's got tons of successful businesses in the blue collar space, and he's coming out with a brand new book called Blue Collar Cash. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, Ken. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I like your philosophy about college. So why don't you tell us a little bit about sort of the background and where the, the whole blue collar cash came from? Well, you know, I noticed uh, I, I hire a lot of people. I, I have a, a one of the things that I do is I have a construction company. We have a lot of employees. So I noticed when I was hiring them in over the last uh, five or 10 years that, you know, the experience levels were less and less and less. And, you know, if, if you pair up um, what's happening in today's society with, you know, take a step back to they got rid of shop class back in the 70s and 80s. And um, when that went away, it also took a lot of people you know, off the grid who possibly would have been carpenters and plumbers and, and brick masons and, and bakers and, and all those kinds of things. So, you know, f for me, the pendulum swung so far towards college is your only way to go. And I thought, well, nothing could be further from the truth there. So. That totally makes sense. I used to be a business coach for mostly blue cult plumbing companies. You know, the, the unsexy work that actually makes a lot more money than people realize on the back end, right? That doesn't take a whole lot of, I shouldn't say education. It totally takes a lot of education, but we sort of put it on the side and go, Oh, well, that's over here, right? Why do you think we've done that? You know, I don't know. I, I, there's, there's almost this kind of built in stigma that happened, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. I remember being at a party about a year ago and, and, you know, all parents love to talk about their kids and they love to brag about where they're going and what school they're going to and what they're going to be. And, and I heard one gal say to another gal, well, what, what about your son X? And she said, well, he, he's just going to be a plumber. And when I heard that, I, I almost wanted to interrupt their conversation because little did she know there is such great opportunity for people who are willing to work with their hands and and there's never been a better time to start your own business. So, you know, again, some people have some pretty serious stigma about that, but um, it's a pretty it's a pretty good hidden secret that there's a lot of opportunity in the blue collar world today. Well, even just the amount of different industries that I've seen in from windows to there's just so many different facets of it. And like you said, it doesn't take a lot of debt a lot of the times, especially if they're service based stuff to even get into. And we sort of go, oh, well, you know, there's so many plumbers out there. There's so many this out there that where am I going to sort of fit in the mold? How do you uh, tell people a sort of what industry to start choosing? Well, first off, the, the, the quickest and easiest answer is to just try some things. You know, that you hear a lot about gap years and you hear a lot about uh, kids going through um, high school and working part-time jobs. I just think you should try some things. There, there's, there's lots of kids. Um, I, I'll never forget, I was, I was uh, renting a car from a car rental place, and the guy behind the desk, I had a chance to talk to him for about 15 or 20 minutes, and he was really bummed that he got kind of sold this whole college degree thing. And he's like, you know, I'm 70000 in debt. I'm sitting here working at this company making 32000 a year. I don't know how I'm ever going to pay this off. And the one thing he said to me was, I really wanted to be a carpenter. And I, I wish I could have done that, but I listened to everybody else. I listened to my parents. I listened to the school. I listened to the college recruiters. And if you don't go to college, you're nothing. You're never going to amount to anything. And I, I just felt so bad for him. So I, I think people kind of understand um, you know, what their true passions are. And I always say, who but you knows who you could really be and who but you knows what you should be doing for a living. So, you know, look inside yourself, give, give a couple of things to try and something's going to present itself. I promise you. I, I just remember being a junior and senior in high school and going like, I don't know what I want to do because I didn't test anything. <laughs> I was like, you know what I mean? Right. When, when you're in high school, my kids go to an entrepreneur kids school now and all of high school is them testing different modalities to see what they like, to figure out what their strengths are first, before you choose. Who knew, right? Well, my when my daughter went to high school, she came home and it was within her first year. She was a freshman. And I'll never forget, she said, you know, the the teachers are asking me what I want to do for a living and, and what college I want to go to. And I said, Nicole, you're 15. How could you possibly know the answers to those questions yet? What they didn't ask is, what else could you be good at? 
You know, what, what possibly could you do working with your hands or starting your own business or, or, uh, you know, being, a, um, uh, learning from someone else that's, that's already in one of these really lucrative industries. So they kind of, they kind of like led them only down one path. And I think that's pretty sad. <laughs> well, it's also kind of sad that even adults don't even know what we want to do, right? Like we haven't tested enough things to even know what we want. Even right. if, you know, I mean, I, going into a job, I remember going into a job and being like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do and realizing, wow, this really sucks. I would never like to continue this for the rest of my life. What now? What? Yeah. Right. And I had sort of a quarter life crisis going, well, what do, what are my strengths? Never, never had I asked that question before. It was always, what am I automatically good at that would pay me more money? <laughs> And that's not the right, right question to ask, especially not understanding yourself as well as you could. So what do you suggest for people, though, that um, maybe are out of college exactly. that, that are trying to go, OK, well, I don't know. How do I test this? Like, do I go get a job as a plumber and see if I like it or what sort of skill sets do I need in advance? Well, I, I think first off, most kids that I talk to realize when they're in school man, this just isn't for me. So there's some soul searching that happens almost right off the bat. Beyond that, I think, again, the, the good news is because of that pendulum swing so far to the left towards college is the only way, there are so many opportunities available right now. Um, I, you drive down from my office to the freeway and you pass 50 help wanted signs. So you have the option of, of maybe maybe a gap year kind of thing or, or maybe taking some time to just look around and take take some of these opportunities almost kind of like almost kind of like a micro dirty jobs kind of thing where you just try things over and over and and see what you like I mean you'll find it because first off if you have the right vision for what you want your life to look like sometimes this is a little controversial but sometimes I say and maybe it isn't so important what you do for a living as it is what you do with what you do for a living. And I think, I think it all starts with a vision of what do I want my life to look like? And that's kind of what took me from 15 to where I am today. Well, and especially let's talk about your um, trajectory, right? Did you always know that you were going to be a business owner? Was it something that just sort of evolved naturally? No, I didn't. The, the first thing that I realized was I knew how I wanted to live. You know, I remember watching old shows like Heart to Heart and, and those kind of shows where, you know, you get to see how different people live. And, and I always thought, you know, there, there are certain things that I'd like to surround myself with as, as I get older and as, as I grow into, into my envisioned life, okay, my perfect version of comfort, peace, and freedom. And along the path, I just, I started out with what do I want my life to look like first? And then what type of jobs would help support that? I mean, it started with just buying enough gas for my car to go out with my friends on a Friday night, but then it just kind of blossomed into um, what could I do um, to control my own income so that I could get the things that I wanted. And, um, you know, fortunately, right next to my high school, there was a company that was hiring both ditch diggers and marketing personnel. So I was able to do the ditch digging during the summer and the marketing during the winter. And um, I just kind of like kept going and kind of felt my way through the company and then just kept rising in the ranks there. So that's funny. I just thought I was a road sweeper in the first. There you go. So, yeah, woo <laughs> that's fun, fun work. Uh, right. Right. Up all the sand off the road as a little kid. Good labor. <laughs> um, but, but one of the things that you said is sort of learning the marketing piece then, too. So how did you actually evolve into a business owner? Because there's so many facets in business. So there's the service, of course, that you need to be working on, whether it be ditch digging or plumbing or whatever it is. But then there's the whole business back end. How did you start learning that? Well, there's there's two things I want to say about that. Back in the day, you didn't have a lot of these management software programs that you have now. You didn't have a lot of these bookkeeping software programs that you have now. So I would say today it's a lot easier because a lot of those paths are already walked for you, like how to pay the bills and how to do financial statements and how to do all you know, business plans and all that kind of stuff. So take advantage of all that, te that the technology has to offer. But for me, I just knew that if I got into a company, I wanted to learn everything I could about all aspects of it. And what's really great about that is, as, as a boss, I couldn't wait to have an employee like that. Because if I have somebody that comes in and just wants to absorb everything that I've got, I can't wait to teach them what everything that I know. Because first off, that employee is going to be much better off for me while they're there. And secondly, if there's a chance that I can keep him or her within my fold, and then help them get the life that they want, I'm going to have an amazingly um, loyal employee and um, 
a very smart one in the end, right? What do you suggest to people, especially that might have a business already or parts of a business and maybe want to think about doing something else to go into sort of the blue collar side of things? So maybe, or maybe they know business, you know, quote unquote, business, MBA, <laughs> having an MBA, knowing business are two different things potentially. Right. Uh, so, so, but going into sort of more of a blue collar side of things, because like you said, there's a lot of opportunity there. I think the biggest thing, if you're already business oriented and you're trying to find what blue collar company might match that. It's real simple. Just look around at the supply and demand within your your your, your region. Um, I, I'll give an example. Uh, I, I had a, a stone fence built outside my house with a little wrought iron gate on top, and I had to wait six months for this guy to come to my house. And I, I knew some of the other people he was working with, and he was fantastic at it. But I also knew one other thing. I knew that he was just about ready to retire, and he had this amazing company with five or six employees. He got to come to work every day with his brand new pickup truck. He'd jump out of the truck with his t-shirt and his jeans and his cup of coffee, put on some Led Zeppelin, and him and the crew would build these amazing outdoor kitchens and this beautiful artwork. Well, he had nobody to leave this company to. He was literally going to take a thriving enterprise and just kind of shut it down. And, and so when I think about that, if you already have a sense of what business is like, Look around and see where the demand is highest, okay, and the supply is the smallest, and jump into something like that. I love that. Everybody, I had a client in hardscaping. Hardscaping is amazing and very it's, I think it's awesome. Very, yeah, it's fantastic very, to watch. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and not something that, no offense to all the people listening, the internet entrepreneurs don't talk about, you know, hardscaping or, or landscaping businesses or anything like that, right? Because it's not as right. sexy, quote, unquote. But again, Correct. the margins are pretty good on those. Well, if you think about any time, I mean, if you know anything about supply and demand, any time the pendulum swings one way, you know, it's almost like they say, if everybody's betting on that team, you should probably bet on the other one. And, and the reason they say that is because if you take that type of attitude, you're going to be there um, to, to, to get deep into that opportunity. And I look at it this way. If everybody's doing going that way and no one's willing to work with their hands anymore, you know, the money has to go there. It, it has to go to those industries because there's not not enough people willing to do those things anymore. But I love it. Good good reminder for everybody. Unsexy makes money, yeah. people. You said earlier, comfort, oh, peace, sure. and freedom. And I think that's really, really important. How did you sort of pick out those core values for yourself? You know, it's funny because I was writing a letter to my daughter. She was sick at the time. and She, she was battling a pretty serious disease. And, and um, I just wanted to write her a letter to talk to her about what I thought was important in life. You know, you, you can chase dollars all you want. And, and I know people that are wealthy that are miserable. Um, and I know people that have these amazing middle class lives that are, they just, they're just so fulfilled. So I, I kind of started analyzing all those people and I came up with three words that just wouldn't go away comfort, peace, and freedom. And I kind of use them in a triangle, if you will, where one is kind of interdependent on the other. So I started writing this letter to Nicole about, what I thought was um, important in life and, and um, living a life of anticipation and, and going towards those three concepts. And, you know, 80,000 words later, all of a sudden I had a book. So it was, um, <laughs> it, it was pretty, pretty amazing that I even got this far with it. That's really awesome. What, what was that um, inspiration to continue to do 80,000 words? Cause, cause that's, I, I read a book. It takes a lot to write a book. Well, and this is where it gets worse because I'm not really the best typer in the world, so I actually hand wrote. I filled up 12 legal pads, and, and I just I couldn't stop. Every time I, I was writing, 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 and more ideas and more concepts, and then friends that I knew that had overcome unbelievable challenges that are successful business owners, I started writing stories about them and sharing their story with everybody. And I'll never forget, I was on an airplane, and I, I was writing feverishly, and I kept shaking my hand because I was like, okay, I'm getting tired. And... The guy sitting next to me said, what are you doing? I said, well, I think I'm writing a book. And he said, you're writing a book as in handwriting? And I said, yeah. And I pulled out the rest of these legal pads, and he just couldn't believe it. But it was, uh, it was a labor of love, I can tell you. The words flew out as fast as I could put them down. So. And the amount of hand cramps you must have had must have yeah. been ridiculous. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, I had plenty of that too. <laughs> Well, and that's one of the reasons why I started the show too, because uh, not not to degrade your book, but I feel like everybody that writes a book is like, oh, we know all about success. But then there's all these business owners that are in the trenches, not writing the books yet, but in the yeah. trenches and have so many really wise stories, both about like what's working right now, but also of overcoming these obstacles that are that are pretty intense. Can you share a couple of the stories that are in your book? Yeah, one of them was um, a, a gentleman who, um, he had a pretty bad childhood, and um, he, he just, the only people that loved him were his friends, and unfortunately, his friends were not very supportive. They were, they were on the dark side, and um, took him way down a bad, into a bad place, and um, he had several really close call-ins with, you know, maybe not coming back from it, and he, he, he always liked working with wood. So he, he went to um, a friend and then he went to a relative and he finally got with him and started uh, to relapse and, uh, a few times, but then finally said enough. And um, now he is an award-winning builder. He has his own company. He's been doing it for years. He, he gives back. He's helped build churches and Habitat for Humanity. And he's just an amazing guy. And, and, you know, it takes a long time to tell the story, but to see where he came from, it was such a dark place. And to see where he is now, it's just, it's totally inspiring. Well, that's the thing that I always joke, uh, half joke about is like the success story to say, this is the before and this is the after takes a couple minutes, but the living through the pain of overcoming each of those yeah. obstacles, especially for how far he had to bring himself up or, or you from going, Oh, I was digging ditches for a little while. I, I don't think we, um, understand what the living of that experience really can be like with all those ups and downs for somebody else when we just sort of uh, story tell some of it. And then it's hard. It's not, it's not like business ownership is easy. And I think unfortunately right. we've got internet people going, it's so easy. Start your own business and make a ton of money. And I'm pretty sure yeah. you have the same sentiment. Well, you know, you own everything, you know, owning a business is a lot like playing golf. You know, when, when you're out on the golf course, everything is your fault. Okay. You hit a good one, it's your fault. You hit a bad one, it's your fault. You dump one in the pond, your fault, okay? And um, there's, there's usually nobody behind you saying, well, here, let me do that for you. I mean, you just can't. So owning a business is, is a lot like that game, which I love, by the way, because there's just this enormous accountability. And there are days when I walk out the front door and go, oh, my gosh, I mean, you know, all the things I had to do that day. But um, it's it's so totally rewarding. I mean, you know, I always talk about this step back moment where you build something, you fix something, you make somebody happy, and then you get to take that five steps backwards at the end of the day and look at it and go, wow, I did that. I did that you know, with my own hands and, and my guys. And there's just a whole lot of organic happiness that comes from that. I noticed your golf pictures in the background as soon as we started on the, <laughs> on the call too. Because it's, number one, it's so difficult. And the and the the feeling of your brain as you go into it makes a huge difference, right? The clarity of thought so that way you can sort of right. be in flow is huge. And I find it's really important in business to do the same thing. Do you feel like on the golf course you bring some of those lessons to the business side of things? Well, yeah. I mean, you, you definitely have to hold yourself accountable. I mean, you, you, you have to get up because, I mean, if, if you're leading a group of people, I mean, it's on you to step up and provide a, a beautiful culture every day. And I think that's one of the things that I try to do most is create a culture where people want to be here. Um, for me, my goal is to gather as many people as I can who are very goal oriented or that I can help create to become goal oriented. Everybody here has a goal. We all write them on the board in the hallway. They all are shared with everybody. Um, if, if you're not anticipating something, if you're not chasing a goal, it, you know, you're not going to fit in around here. So my goal is that everybody gets what they want first. And if and when that happens, then myself and my company will get what we want. I mean, there's just no other way to think about it. I really appreciate you saying that because even when I start working or talking to prospects that have blue collar companies, a lot of the times they're like, the workforce sucks. The, the, at the, this dollar an hour, we don't get good help. And they like complaining all about their workforce when it's like, okay, well, that's not, <laughs> number one, that's not a good, good sort of culture that you have. Did you feel like you had to start from this ground up right. or was there ways that you sort of had to tweak your culture, especially for the years that you've been doing it? 
Well, you know, it, it used to be in the old days that, you know, I am boss, you are employee. And that, you know, it was almost this animosity type relationship or this, you're going to respect me just because of who I am. I think that's gone. I don't think that really serves any purpose. Um, nowadays, it's more like, you know, when I have a new employee come in and they almost are of the mindset of, hey, what's in it for me to work here? Okay. Think of that question being asked 20 or 30 years ago, right? right. Well, a, a lot of employers kind of gristle at that. They're like, wow, how dare you say something? I love that because if I can show them what's in it for them to work here and how I'm more interested in their personal betterment than I am in anything else, that's a really different approach. And, and people, people really gravitate towards a, a place that interests in them specifically, not just in what they can do for me or do for my company. And that's why, to me, uh, if I have someone who's living a life of anticipation, chasing after goals, that is as or more important than, you know, how fast they can work-wise in our company. Because you care about them as humans also, which is great, but <laughs> very kind of important that nobody really talks about, right? The right. actual care of the human, and especially as a leader trying to level people up. How can you align that with your goals, though? If they're completely misaligned, do you say, okay, your goal doesn't align here, or we don't have an option for you? Or is it like their, their goals, somehow we can figure out a way that it aligns with your goals also? Yeah, you know, for, for me, the first thing that we do is we make sure that we, it's kind of old fashioned, but I'll, I'll take a big piece of paper, a big poster board and a box of Crayola crayons, and I'll just hand them the crayons and the, and the paper and I'll say, draw your life. Just draw what you want your life to look like. What's your version of comfort, peace and freedom? And it's amazing how different all of these are. It, it's, it's, it's so much fun to watch them do that. And then what we do is you know, once they realize that, wow, this this company cares about what my future looks like, then we just take one of those goals at a time, chop it up into little pieces, and we just start going after it. You know, one, once I'm convinced that they own it, I do everything I can to make sure that they make that goal happen. And then we go after the second one and the third one. And again, I've said it a few times that living a life of anticipation, there, there's just no other way to live. Okay, talk about what that is then, because living a life of anticipation versus being anxious is very, very counterintuitive, right? Because some people are in the culture right. that we live in right now, it's almost anxiety producing trying to think of the future instead of anticipation, which has a good connotation. Well, think of it this way. Um, uh, imagine, if you can, the last time you planned a vacation. Most people plan vacations between three and four months out. Well, there's all these things that you imagine. Okay, if I'm going to the beach, I need a bathing suit and I need my um, my towel and I need my stuff I take to the beach with me, whether it's a book or a radio, my suntan lotion. And you can almost smell the salt air and you can you can kind of feel what the ocean's going to be like and the sun on your skin. And you're, you're actually anticipating this vacation for three or four months at a time. And then it gets better as you go along and pretty soon you're there and it's just awesome, right? Why can't you do that with your life, whether it's I'm going to pay my visa bill off or I'm going to get a new motorcycle or I want to, you know, take that photography class or be a better parent or I want to exercise or whatever it might be, learn Spanish. Why can't you anticipate several things at a time and feel that same feeling that you feel like when you make a vacation happen? That's really the goal of 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 of. of of having a really fulfilling life without, like you said, becoming anxious about it. That's a, that's a really good way to put it. I've, I've interviewed almost 500 millionaires, and what's so interesting is visioning comes up over and over and over again. But we have sort right. of this, I don't know, resistance to visioning sometimes because it's too woo-woo or too whatever. But your, the, your explanation, we do it for vacations, and we enjoy the entire way of getting excited yeah. over it, right? Like, why would we not do that? You, and, it, and it helps us just propel the momentum forward anyway. So how do you actually do that? Like, what do you do in your daily life to actually anticipate this fun stuff? Do you just bring it up in, mentally? Do you put things around you? What do you do to tangibly do it? Well, if I if I spun this computer in a circle, you'd see pictures of, you know, golf courses and my dogs and my family. And you'd see pictures of trips that I've been on and um, things that I still have yet to do. I have a, um, a behind me over here. I have building plans for my next building. 
Um, so I, I'm constantly putting things in front of me. And I, I think that's why I'm so, it's so important that not only when you, when you draw this, but you keep it in front of you. Real interesting statistic, I'll tell you real quick. It was done by um, Virginia Tech. They said 80% of people don't have any goals. They said of the 20 that's left, 16% have a goal, but have never really written it down, documented it, drawn it in any way, shape, or form. Of the four that are left, three of those people actually document their goals, but then they take them and just stick them in a drawer somewhere. Only 1% of people write down the goal, keep it in front of them, and review it on a, on a regular basis. Those same people also happen to earn nine times more during their lifetime than the other people in that study. And I, I just think to myself, it's such an easy thing to do if, it's, if you just become aware of it. Put things in front of you. The law of attraction brings them to you. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's the most powerful thing I've ever encountered when it comes to um, visual in the future. I love you saying this too, especially in the day and age that we live in right now, because I feel like people are a little, there's so much uncertainty at this time in 2020, like 2020 has just been crazy. Um, it's been crazy. Right. So then, then we sort of pull back and go, oh, well, I don't want to put any dates because nobody knows anything. Do you put dates on some of your stuff or are we just sort of trying to get the juices flowing for something that you're excited about? Well, one of the things I say in the book, when I talk about the five different ways to set a goal, one of the most important things is to set it with certainty. And when you're, when you're building a goal and you really actually have to build it, let's assume you want something that's going to cost you $5,000. Maybe it's a trip to um, Europe or something. Well, if you're going to do that in two years, you need to save $50 a week for 52 weeks times two, 104 weeks. So there's a beginning date, there's an end date, and there's a series of 104 steps on your path to going to wherever you're going, Scotland, wherever it might be. So you, you, you have to put that down in a crystal clear way, not only for yourself, but so that when you share that with others, they also know what you're up to. And, you know, just like when you were jumping off the high board for the first time when you were a little kid, your buddies are the ones that helped you get up on that ladder and help you walk down that diving board and help you jump off. If they weren't there, you wouldn't be jumping off that board that day. So it's really important to not only set it with absolute complete clarity, but then to be able to share that in public. And then people will, I mean, again, you're going to make it happen. I, I promise you that. I, I write in my uh, to-do list. I have like a friend the other week and he was talking about taking the leap and I'm like, oh, I have to follow up with him because see if he doesn't do it, I'm going to, you know what I mean? Right. Da, da, da. See that? <laughs> Good friend, right? I mostly just want to shame him for, no, I'm kidding, <laughs> for not doing yeah. it. Um, but, hey, as long as it gets it done, that's what matters. Right? Just match, match the energy. He, he knows right. what it's, what's up. Um, right. Tell me about the people that don't know or they're confused because I think that's the other thing is that we just assume that everybody should be able to write their goals down in a defense definitive manner very easily. And, and it's not really that easy. I've worked with a lot of clients and it's like, I don't, there's either too many choices or I don't know what to put first or how do you help people with that? Well, uh, again, I think the first thing you need to make sure is that you have something that you really, really want. Um, as you're building your picture and sometimes the pictures are built slower. I've had people that have built this picture with their crayons and their paper in a weekend. I've had people say, you know, Ken, I had to put it down on a table like a puzzle and I had to work on it and walk away and then work on it some more and walk away. And what they're really doing is they're trying to own it. So they draw a little bit and then they put the pencil down, they walk away, and then they come back a couple of days later, pick up their crayons and they draw it some more. And what they're really doing is they're saying, is that really what I want? So the first step is to get you to own it. And I mean, you wake up thinking about it, you know, it's in front of you in some fashion and it's something you have to do. And, and I think that's what's really important because if, if you can't visualize it like a brochure in your mind, you know, I, I want a pet, okay, dog or cat, what kind of dog, how big is this dog, are you going to get it from a pound or are you going to get it from a rescue or are you going to, I mean, how, where are you going to find, are you going to, uh, from a breeder, what are you going to name this dog? I mean, you have to get down to the absolute minute detail and, and you have to own that goal before you can even attempt to go after it. I love that you said that with that specific story because I just got a puppy and it was been it had been in my vision board and on my I have a mind movie so it's like a, a you know movie version of what you're talking about right. um, and 
and I've been wanting a dog, but with the pandemic and not wanting to to be around anybody, I'm not, I'm like, I'm not going to a, a pound. I'm not going to go find a breeder or anything like that. And one just right. fell in my lap and she's like, so perfect. She's the brother of, or she's the sister of um uh, my ex-husband's dog. So we have two little matching dogs that just sort of yeah. came out of nowhere and I didn't even have to go after it. So it it is, it's really interesting. It was on my list, but yeah. never sort of, I didn't really put a lot of action behind it. So it was really kind of um, interesting. But, that you use that story. but it was, it was in your subconscious though. And your subconscious is pretty powerful. So it, you attracted yourself to that for sure, just by thinking about it. Though didn't realize how much puppy training there would be. I mean, I've had oh, many yeah. puppies before, but Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. She's from a they pound. Call it, <laughs> yeah, they good. call it puppy deal for a reason. Yeah, there's no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> cute though. Very, very cute. Uh, so yeah. how do we start getting people into um, dealing with visioning? Because I feel like it's one of those things, like you said, is we'll put it on, even if we write that crayon thing, then we sort of put it away and don't really think about it. Or people will write goals on their computer and then it'll go away for a really long period of time. What's your system to actually look at it consistently so you you keep it uh present. Okay. The first step you have to do is you have to congratulate yourself. And I know that seems a little bit um, backwards, but you know how when you, um, when you want to quit smoking, for example, you know, people will say, I couldn't quit until I told myself I'm not a smoker anymore. Okay. Or if you want to lose weight or if you want to do this or that, you have to tell yourself, I am that person now. So you put yourself in that position, you congratulate yourself and, and there you are. And, once that step is done, you know, again, you have to own it. You have to visualize it. You have to see exactly what you want it to be. You have to draw it. You have to keep it in front of you. But then there's some things that people miss. And that is the most important part. You have to make sure that this is going to happen for sure. And, and the, the way to do that is to build it with certainty, like the steps I talked about earlier, 104 steps, $50 a week, beginning date, end date. But then you need to take it to the next step, which is to make it actionable. You know, go to your payroll clerk and say, I want you to take 50 bucks a week out of my check and put it in this account. I don't want to even see my debit card. I don't want the checks. Lock them up. I don't want to go anywhere near this money. So I don't touch it if something goes wrong. And then you share that goal with someone who really believes in you and they can put their hand on your shoulder if you decide to turn sideways a little bit as you're walking this path. If, if you do those five things, you only need to do that once and, and you will become a goal crushing machine. I mean, it, I see it happen all the time. Um, and, and again, the goals can be big goals. They can be medium goals, small ones. It doesn't matter. But once you hit your first one, you'll start to anticipate two or three at a time. Maybe one that's three months, maybe one that's a year, maybe one that's five years. And there's just so much comfort in knowing that I'm just walking the path. And as long as I breathe, I'm going to make this thing happen. What about setbacks then too, especially like in the example you're saying, I'm just imagining all the people that just lost their job. So they're like $50 a, a week trying to get a vacation and then 2020 happened. <laughs> like what, yeah. do, what, what do you say for people that, you know, it, are they still keeping the same goal and just pushing it out farther or what, what about setbacks? Well, again, if, if you think about making it with certainty, you just hit it right on the head. When I first went to Scotland, you know, a, a, a lot of buddies, in, uh, we go on these golf trips to northern Michigan every year, and they're fantastic. You get in your car, four hours later, you're there, you have a great time. I was sitting around the lunch table with them one time, and I said, why don't we go to St. Andrews, the home of golf in Scotland? Let's do that. And they looked at me like, well, how the heck are we going to do that? That's really expensive. I said, yeah, it's expensive now, but if we put this off three years, Okay, we can make it happen for sure, not just maybe, but for sure. So to answer your question, that is the answer. If, if you get a setback, first off, hopefully the person that is sharing you shared this goal with is going to keep you on the path. But if you do have a setback, all you do is just move the end date back a little bit. But you don't lose the enthusiasm and you don't lose the hope and you don't lose the anticipation for wanting to get that done. Because, you know, if someone came up to you and said, hey, you're still going to go to that Florida vacation instead of four months from now. It's going to be eight months from now. You still can anticipate it. So yeah, just push it back. It can happen. Yeah. I joke that walls will just come up and it's like, well, they come up for absolutely everything that you ever want in life. So you got to learn how to get over the wall. Otherwise you're going to be stuck in a box for, <laughs> for your entire life. And that's not fun either, right? We're just going to be that's stuck. An, that's an absolute fact. <laughs> <laughs> I know we have to start wrapping up. So I'm going to ask the last question. What is one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? 
I, I think um, the first thing I would do is really learn to pay yourself first. You know, when, when I interview somebody and they say, um, what's the pay going to be? And I say, well, it's going to be 40000 a year or 50000 a year. The first thing I want them to say is, okay, thanks for paying me 37000 a year. Because you need to take that first $3,000 and forget about it. Just like you would if you had to pay parking downtown and, you know, that money is just vaporized, okay? You don't ever get to see that again. Take the first $3,000 of your money, put it into a long-term investment. It will guarantee yourself to be a millionaire by the time you retire. I know. We forget that often here. It's like, mm -hmm. wait, there's quick fixes for – oh, wait. Mm, time actually really compounds just so we it remember does. people. <laughs> I really Time is a friend of money, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Ken. Where can they find you? Where do they get the book? Tell me more. So they can go to KenRusk.com and find out what we're up to there. I'm also on Ken Rusk Official on Facebook, and uh, you can see what we're doing there. And uh, the book will come out on July 28th through Barnes & Nobles and Amazon and Indie Books and wherever books are sold. So I'm really pumped for it. I hope it, uh, hope it does well. Awesome. Everybody check that out. And thanks so much for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. Thank you, too. If you enjoy this show, I would really appreciate your wonderful words of feedback. Go leave me a review. I would love a rating. Whatever you can do in the time that you've got, I would so appreciate it.